Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, July 8th, 2020. And every time I you know, talk with someone about some political issue, I hear people calling for almost everything to be turned into a federal issue. Whenever there's a problem where someone doesn't like something, Congress needs to ban it or you got to go to the federal courts to deal with it and the federal courts can strike it down. But leading Federalist supporters of the Constitution told us over and over and over that criminal law, except a few very narrow cases, very narrow situations spelled out in the Constitution most specifically, we're going to be the purview of the states, the people of the several states. So I'm going to go through some of that. I'm going to go through today some of the things that the leading founders and leading Federalist advocates of the Constitution told us about criminal laws and state and federal power. And then I'm also going to share with you five categories of criminal laws that Congress is authorized to make under the Constitution. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. But let's get right to it. And I want to first start out with this article that we published all the way back in 2013 by Mike Meharry. And mind you, over at 10thamendmentcenter.com, we've got probably 10 to 15,000 articles, blogs, uh, papers, videos, podcasts, etc. So there's a lot of content. And as I go through this stuff, I'm looking through keywords. The search engine on our site really needs to be improved over time. But as I look through this, I, I'm finding more stuff that's relevant that we published 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Well, not 15, but close to it. Close to 15 years ago. This one from 2013. Mike Meharry starts out imploring people to not don't make a federal case out of it. Seriously, that's the title. And he says, you don't have to make a federal case out of it. When I was a kid, we used to use that phrase a lot. When people would get all up apoplectic about some issue that wasn't really that big of a deal. And now sometimes things are a big deal, but they still aren't a federal case. And Mike says, well, I, today I find myself using that phrase on pretty much a daily basis. Because some people can't seem to resist the temptation to make a federal case out of, well, pretty much everything. And the feds, and this is the important thing, the feds have zero constitutional authority to stick their collective noses into just about everything they meddle about in. If we're going to be constitutionalists, if we're going to be tenthers, to use that term that they tried to use as a negative some years ago, if we're going to support the founders and ratifiers constitution as legally enacted so long ago, then we're going to take the position that most of what the federal government does isn't authorized. And the, one of the big things that they do is they meddle in state law. Everything gets turned into a federal issue. Part of that is through the nationalization and militarization of police. They require joint law enforcement uh, task forces, or they ask for it, and the locals so gladly participate to get a lot of that handout cash and the civil forfeiture ripoff money that they steal from people and then divvy up 80-20, 80 to the locals, 20 to the feds. So they're very happy to participate in this, but they don't have to. And of course, we know they're not supposed to. I want to go through some of the leading founders talking about this. First of all, we can start out with James Madison. And this is more of a broad statement. Federalist 45, he was primarily writing to a New York audience, arguing in favor of ratification of the Constitution. But this is how Madison put it. The powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. And he goes on, he says, the powers reserved to the several states will extend to all the objects which, in the ordinary course of affairs, concern the lives, liberties, and properties of the people, and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. We would call this the police power. I was reading a, a paper written by Randy Barnett, uh, the great uh, Georgetown law constitutional scholar. I don't, I mean, when I say someone is great, they do a lot of great work. I don't, I want to make it clear that I don't necessarily agree with everything that they say. They don't agree with me. You don't have to agree with everybody to think that they do great work. 
So just wanted to make that quick aside. In case, not necessarily that Randy's a bad guy. I don't know him personally, but he's done really great work on studying the original legal meaning of the Constitution. He does has one from like 2004, the original meaning of the police power. And he noted that th that phrase or police was only mentioned a handful of times at the Philadelphia Convention. I think he counted out like six or seven times and then maybe just a handful of times during the debates. But it was widely understood, according to this type of principle, that Madison pointed out in Federalist 45 that the vast majority of powers, the police powers, really were in the hands of the states or the people of the several states as they determined. And here's the big government guy of the time, Alexander Hamilton. This is in Federalist 17. He says, there's one transcendent advantage belonging to the province of the state governments, which alone suffices to place the matter in a clear and satisfactory light. I mean, the ordinary administration of criminal and civil justice. Here's the guy who wanted the federal government to be bigger than anybody at the, well, there's a few people, him, Wilson, Governor Morris, a few people really wanted a big, big central government. And even their version of big central government would have been tiny compared to what we live under today, what we toil under today. But even someone like Hamilton, and that's why I like pointing out Hamilton quotes, because when Hamilton takes the right position, it, it points out that what we face today is absolutely nuts because he was really one of the bad guys of the bad guys when you talk about size and scope of government at the time. And he points out that specifically the province of the state governments, civil and criminal justice. So criminal law was going to be a, the purview of states, states and their political subdivisions. Here's Hamilton again. So the following year in the New York ratifying convention, June of 1788, he put it this way. The laws of Congress are restricted to a certain sphere. And when they depart from this sphere, they are no longer supreme or binding. In the same manner, the states have certain independent powers in which their laws are supreme. For example, in making and executing laws concerning the punishment of certain crimes, such as murder, theft, etc., the states cannot be controlled. It is up to the states to determine how criminal laws will be applied and implemented and enacted and the like. These are not of a federal nature. So Hamilton reaffirmed this type uh, of viewpoint that Madison did in Federalist 45, that other people like John Dickinson did going even further back that the federal government is one of defined enumerated powers and everything else is reserved. That's the 10th Amendment as a summary. James Iredell, who I've cited many times, was one of the first justices of the Supreme Court. I think he was like number four or number five, appointed by George Washington. He served until he passed away. I think it was 1799 of North Carolina. He was a very highly respected legal mind. And here from an article by Rob Nadelson, that I covered recently, the enumerated powers of states, Iredell itemized among the powers not granted to the federal government, control of religion, punishment of crimes other than treason, offenses against the law of nations, or felonies on the high seas. Again, criminal law was going to be left to the states. It's not a federal issue whatsoever. Or here's St. George Tucker in his very important 1803 treatise on the Constitution, which everyone cited, which the Supreme Court cited all the leading experts of the time. And he says he's talking about what criminal cases the Supreme Court could even address, the federal courts. And he's talking about criminal laws in regards to the purview of the federal government. He says areas within the precincts of the seat of government not exceeding 10 miles square or within the precincts of forts, dockyards, magazines, and arsenals. So on constitutionally authorized federal land and military installations, military property in the District of Columbia, for example, that land purchased with the consent of the state in which they may be, of course, with the consent of that state. So those are, they can make criminal laws for those areas because those are federal pieces of property. They aren't under the purview of the states there. And he says, finally, Again, he's reiterating these three that we really know. Treason against the United States, piracies and felonies committed upon the high seas, offenses against the laws of nation, law of nations, and against the revenue laws of the United States.
But yet, even though it's been very clear that the federal government, it doesn't take a lot of work to see that the founders told us over and over that criminal law would be the purview of the states. Everybody wants to make a federal case out of everything. And if I can get this article pulled up, this is from Jonathan Adler at the Volokh Conspiracy on Reason. And he puts it this way, existing doctrine, this is an interesting article called Turning Local Disturbances into Federal Cases, covering some of the recent activity that's been happening and the damage to property around the country, uh, protests, riots, whatever you want to call them. But a lot of them are, the federal government is sticking their nose into a lot of stuff. And Jonathan is pointing out that this is really not a federal issue. They want to turn everything into terrorism, of course. Call everything a terror terrorist, call every activity terrorism, then the federal government can step in. And you wouldn't shouldn't be too surprised when merely owning a handgun means you're a terrorist. So really, really a warning for people who keep pushing this. And I'm looking right at you a vast majority of Republicans who seem to be on board with this just because your team is in charge. But it's not going to be that way forever. And Adler puts it this way. Existing doctrine is quite permissive, too, mer too permissive in my view. And he's just being a lawyer, being very kind of even keeled on this. He should really just hammer him. But maybe that's my job. Quite permissive, too permissive in attempts by federal prosecutors to turn local criminality into federal crimes. If all a U.S. attorney has to do is identify some object cross state lines, virtually every activity becomes subject to federal prosecution. And really, we have to look to the expansion of the Commerce Clause. And I covered this a little bit recently, and I pointed out a recent, and I should have had a link for this as well. But under the Commerce Clause, we know that the original legal meaning of the word commerce is just trade. But they've turned that to all gainful economic activity during the new year, new deal time. And then in more recent years, all human interaction means commerce. And so any human interaction, according to that view, is a fed is federal purview under the Commerce Clause. So this twisting of the original meanings, it has a lot of outgrowth. It really leads to a lot of expansive federal power. So everything really becomes subject to federal prosecution under this view. Further, he writes, it allows federal po prosecutors to select cases for federal prosecution not based upon any legitimate federal interest. And mind you, he's not even getting into the constitutionality, but rather on whether a given case serves the political interests of the office, the Justice Department or the administration. They've turned to politicizing all criminal activity making it a one-size-fits-all solution or looking tough on crime or, or soft on crime, whatever it may be based on who's in charge, doing that makes it a political game rather than a constitutional exercise of power or restraint from power. Here's how Rob Nadelson put it back in that same article. He says, let me see if I can get this centered so you can read it. Extensive federal intervention in criminal law, for example, directly contradicts repeated Federalist assurances that, with few exceptions, criminal law would remain exclusively a state concern. And the TAC's great friend Publius Hulda, I believe her real name is Joanne Martin. She's done so much good work. We've published a lot of her articles. This is one from back in 2015 that I thought was good to revisit. Once I read Adler's post, I'm like, man, I know we've covered this. So I did some digging and I found Publius's article and it's titled, What Criminal Laws Are Congress Authorized to Make? And she starts out her article this way. And I'm going to briefly go through each of these categories. She says, the Constitution grants to Congress, I would say delegates to Congress, only limited powers to make criminal laws. These powers fall into five categories. The first one is, uh, well, let me see if I've got this right. Do I have this? Article 1, Section 8 grants to Congress authority to de define and punish counterfeiting, piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, and offenses against the law of nations. Article 3, Section 3 grants to Congress a restricted power to declare the punishment of treason. So those that are expressly delegated in the text of the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 has those three biggies. Article 3, Section 3, that's number one. Number two, Article 1, wow, I've got these all lined up wrong. I think I was already on to. Article 1, Section 8, last clause grants Congress the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. 
The Constitution, she writes, oh, I'm sorry about the scrolling on this one why I'm getting it wrong. She says, Congress has the authority under the necessary and proper clause to make criminal laws enforcing the taxes, duties, imposts, and exercise, excises authorized by Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 to make criminal laws prohibiting the filing of false statements or claims in bankruptcy, bankruptcy court. That's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4. And to make criminal laws forbidding the importation of slaves after 1808. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1. So there are other things kind of peppered throughout the document where there is an authority under necessary and proper if we understand the, the legal doctrine that James Madison and so many other founders understood well of principles and incidents. It has to be legally an incidental power and necessary and proper to carry it out. So if they can make, enforce these taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, it is clear that they have the incidental power to punish violations of that. So not a real broad scope of that, but certainly that's the second category. Now, three, if I can get to this, which I cannot for some reason. Here we go. Article 1, Section 8. I'll do better on my notes next time. I apologize. Article 1, Section 8, next to the last clause authorizes Congress to ex exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over small, defined geographical areas. The seat of the government of the United States, not to exceed 10 square miles, forts, dockyards, magazines, arsenals, and the like. And then if I can get to D, number four, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 14, authorizes Congress to make rules for the government and, and regulation of the land and naval forces. So land and naval forces. And then the fifth category is amendments. She says some of the amendments to the Constitution authorize Congress to enact laws to enforce them, like the 13th Amendment would authorize Congress to make laws criminally punishing those who keep slaves. Not that that's really an issue anymore, but they are empowered to do that should they need to. The 16th Amendment, unfortunately, I don't think it should even exist, presumably authorizes Congress to make criminal laws to enforce the income tax. I like how she put that in quotes. I think she's got some questions about what actually qualifies as uh, income. The 18th Amendment, now repealed, authorized Congress and the states to make laws criminally punishing those who manufactured or trafficked in intoxicating liquors. So she's listed out a number of amendments where there is a very narrow authority delegated with that to care to enact criminal laws, but not anything and everything, not all human activity. And just to sum that up, again, the five of those categories, this is how Publius put it. I will link to this in the show notes. One, those made pursuant to express authorizations for four specific crimes. Two, those made under the Necessary and Proper Clause. But we have to be very careful on how we read that and not authorize them to do anything and everything. Necessary and Proper is not the same. Same with the issue with the Commerce Clause. Three, those made for the few tiny geographic areas over which Congress has exclusive legislation. Four, those governing the military. And five, those made pursuant to two of the amendments to the Constitution because the third one, the 18th, has been repealed so they don't have authority in that category under that amendment anymore. But that's just a really brief overview. Unfortunately, we have allowed everything to be a federal case, and I think that the problem is both on the left and the right. Of course, we know we can really acknowledge that the left generally likes advancing centralized power, but when they're not in power, we see how they tend to like decentralization, although at the same time, as long as it fits within their narrative. But at the same time, we know that they're going to call for more and more centralized power when they're in charge. But the right really isn't any better. And I think the last few years has proven that out pretty well, because some of the criminal laws that Congress is not authorized to make would be things like the National Firearms Act of 1934, the Gun Control Act of 1968, its amendments in 1986, the Undetectable Firearms Act of 1988, the bump stock ban of 2018, and probably more coming soon. But yet the federal government continues to do this with the support of the right or the right turning a blind eye to it or so many of them saying this is unimportant i don't care i'm not trying to get uh, i'm not trying to get a machine gun that's only for criminals but as soon as you open a door to do it for that type of a situation what do you think the opposition's going to do because you've created the precedent or you've allowed the precedent to stand 
where the federal government can get involved in stuff it was never authorized to get involved in in the first place. I want to take a quick look over at the live chat. Funky euphemism says even commerce is not commerce. So says Wickard versus Filburn. We're actually going to probably publish an article on that that case sometime in the near future. So I appreciate that. Uh, appreciate you mentioning that. Fuzz T Fork over on YouTube says we have Congress making laws without ever reading the Constitution. And whether or not they read it, I think, is is really less of the question. What they count on is that the people at large are OK with them exercising powers that were never delegated to them in the first place. It doesn't matter whether they've read it. In fact, I think many of them probably understand these types of arguments or they don't care because it's not even it's not even in their scope of their job at this point. You get in Congress, you just do whatever the political party that you've joined wants you to do in most situations. Kyle Reese points out that the Fed feds are chosen for propaganda, probably in a lot of those films and TV shows that we see as well. Daniel Snowden. Uh, well, that looks like a personal conversation. Anyways, if you guys have questions or comments or feedback, ideas, thoughts, whatever on this, please continue leaving some comments, whether here live or later on the archives. I will read through all of them a little bit later today. I don't get a chance to uh, reply to all of them, but if you have some other suggestions and you prefer to send an email, you can do that at team at 10th Amendment Center dot com. Again, team at 10th Amendment Center dot com. Troy McLean says, why then don't the Supreme Court strike down the laws as is their assigned duties by the Constitution? Well, so many of the problems that we face today have been reaffirmed by the Supreme Court. We have to remember that the Supreme Court is part, the federal courts are part of the federal government. And if the federal government is the largest government on the history of the, in the history of the planet, by far, that means all parts of the federal government are part of the problem. And going to the federal government to fix problems created by the federal government is not just bad strategy. It is. I encourage you, Troy, if, if you're new here and you haven't heard this type of message uh, before, to check out 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. This is our annual State of the Nullification Movement report. We just published the latest version for 2019 and 2020. Uh, just at the end of, of June. So that will give you about a hundred and some odd pages. The first half explains the strategy of how to restrict, undermine, defeat, and nullify federal acts without going to the federal government in the hopes that the federal government will somehow limit its own power because that never happens. And then the second half really goes through the process by which these strategies that we learn from the founders and the old revolutionaries are being applied on various issues today. So 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to leave any information. You can just download it for free. There's a Kindle version, uh, Apple Books, or a PDF. So please do check that out as well. And if you guys have any other questions, thoughts, comments, etc., please leave them in the comments. I will check them out later. Email me, team at 10thamendmentcenter.com. If you enjoyed the show, and more importantly, if you learned something here, that's what I hope more than anything. Please make sure to smash the like button on whatever platform you're on. Uh, subscribe, get notifications. Like on YouTube, you can click that little bell and get notifications for when I go live or we upload new videos. We'll start doing that sometime in the near future as I'm finally getting settled in in my new apartment. If you're on iTunes or another podcast platform, leaving reviews helps out a lot too. All that stuff, it triggers the algorithm of the platform you watch or listen on, and therefore that algorithm is going to tell the platform to show the program to more people, and it's helping us reach a lot of people. And even more than that, if you want to pitch in financially, I see a bunch of people who are members out there, and I'm very grateful for your support, putting your financial faith behind our work. If you're not able to do it, don't feel any pressure. We're going to continue doing this for free as we've been doing for more than 14 years now. But if you are able to help us out and keep the lights on and expanding and growing, you can pitch in for as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, five categories, only five categories. Everything else, let's focus on pointing people towards state constitutions, state courts, and get the feds the hell out of the way because they are the biggest problem we face. You get the feds out of the way, you get the federal funding out of the way, and then the states are going to be even less problem because most of what they do now 